Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, how are you feeling from your long trip? I'm still catching up a bit. <laughs> yeah. I heard some other people were sick, too, from the trip. Oh. So. I just, I, yeah, I'm a little stuffy. Um, you all came back with COVID. Well, that's what happened last time I went to a national convention, <laughs> yeah. so could be. Uh, if it's COVID, it's the better version. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. My my throat was sore for a day or two, but it, I think it was just like sinus drip. And, um, I'm improving and I'm improving. You're on the mend. Oh, absolutely. Although I did, I had to blow my nose mightily before we got started. Hopefully we can finish before my sinuses fill back up. Sorry yeah. for that image, everybody, but that's... Yeah. Know, that's well, at least didn't have to do it on the podcast, right? That's true. That's true. We might have to pause part <laughs> way through. Go drain again. Um, yeah, it was, um, it was a <coughs> sometimes tedious, more than sometimes... More than a little tedious yeah. sometimes, <laughs> um, but a lot of fun. Uh, good I, people for the most part. You know, I, like our delegation, Alabama, we're, just, we're awesome. <laughs> like yeah. all those people are cool. I like, yeah. I like all of those people. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I met some people. Uh, got a new follower on YouTube, Seth. I met him at the RFKJ speech. Yeah. He was cool. I saw a video of the Trump rally and they were like panning across the crowd and there he was. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if we can call the Trump thing a rally exactly. All of his now speeches think, are rallies, right? I, I think this one had a different feel than most of <laughs> did, them did. Too. Yeah. <laughs> um, DC was cool. I wish I'd gotten to see more of it. We were busy. I mean, I, like we didn't finish business till one a.m. Monday morning, <laughs> Sunday night, Monday morning. Yeah. Um. Uh, it was. Yeah. We spent the whole first day doing credentials, which is like how it seems to go now. It's everybody's fighting over who who's the biggest faction. Yeah. Um. The Libertarian Party is surprisingly factionalized. Yeah. For a bunch of people who are individualist. Yeah. <laughs> they seem to be getting, <laughs> like, I don't know, hurting up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, essentially, there's the Mises Caucus and the opposition. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's kind of what it's become. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, because there used to be, like, pre-Mises Caucus. I, I mean, I remember there being, like, a ton of caucuses. Well, there's still a ton of caucuses. Is there? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the... The party has more or less divided Along on the issue lines. of Mises. Yeah. 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 So, and after this weekend, I kind of get it. <laughs> oh, yeah. We'll get to that later, though. Yeah. We have breaking news to Oh, yeah. So, um, report. I yeah. Suppose. They, um, convicted Trump like just like an hour ago, less than an hour ago, probably on, um, all 34 counts. Was it? I can't even remember. Yeah. I could probably look on my ticker. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Trump's been convicted on all counts in the hush money case. Um, sorry. Yeah, it's 34. Uh, yeah, so it is. It's 34. Yeah. So yeah, Trump convicted on all 34 counts, which seems kind of wild to me. Yeah, it's um, pretty ridiculous. Especially I mean, since the even whole like, case is kind of ridiculous. Well, yeah, but even especially since the left wing media, the, like what I keep hearing reports i hadn't really followed the case very closely but what i kept hearing was oh this was a bad day for the prosecution oh this was a terrible witness for the prosecution oh their uh, prosecution was unable to connect any of these things to trump i, I mean that's that's how it's yeah. been reported by the left wing so the idea that they would then convict him on all on counts is all counts and the report and nothing is, nobody ever gets convicted on all counts yeah that seems kind of suspicious to begin with because i was kind of hearing more of the same thing you were especially like i mean i listened to some attorney on some show a week or so ago and and the argument he was making was that that a lot of these charges 
were couldn't really be connected back to Trump, that they were stuff that his attorneys were responsible for and that type of thing, but that there were a handful that you could make a good argument that, that Trump was responsible for. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, I mean, I, ex and, and based off that, like, cause I haven't followed it that close either, but I figured they would come up with probably about half of them convict and him on yeah. and the other half not, um, for it to be like a clean sweep seems, I don't know. It just, I mean, it just, to me, it just goes to show that, how much this is all just ridiculous. Well, I mean, the the case shouldn't exist, period. Yeah. I mean, the, it's the state court trying to prosecute federal charges yeah. on a guy. I don't know. The whole thing is... Yeah. It, uh, it's, a, it's a novel legal theory. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> I guess it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but well, and all of these should have been misdemeanor charges anyway, from what I understand, right? That they they wrote that they used some kind of novel theory to mm -hmm. to turn them into felonies. Yeah. But that generally these were not because this type of thing happens. Like it's it's all campaign finance, and campaign finance is complicated as crap. Yeah, no kidding. And and even attorneys make mistakes in this. All right, so for everybody out there, I had to handle my own finance reporting for a local election here years ago, 2018, I guess it was. Yeah. And uh, it's insane. It none of it makes any sense. Like it, it is. It would be so incredibly easy to fail to report something or to report something incorrectly. Mm -hmm. um, how they can even identify this as a uh, as an election expense anyway yeah. is just is really reaching for it. Yeah. Um, oh, well, I mean, oh. it, it's no surprise. It'll be appealed to hell though. Like, yeah. Oh, Trump. Oh, so, um, I did throw on the TV because this came out right as I got home and was going to change and come over here. So I did throw on the TV for a minute just to kind of hear what some of the reporting was. And, um, I mean, of course, like I guess one of the guys that was um, that they were interviewing or talking to was in the courtroom when the judgment came out, mm -hmm. and that that Trump was uh, what was the word he had a word he used, but was was extremely pissed, like like visibly pissed, mm -hmm. and um and like I say is is vowing to fight this down to the bitter end and so and so and like say it's it's going to be i mean it's going to end up being appealed like you say yeah um and we'll see where it goes from there and trump i mean trump will probably take it all the way to the supreme court if they'll hear it um i mean i guess it's an election campaign federal campaign statute. finance issue so right? yeah it could go there i don't i don't know i don't know it it'll be interesting to see it'll be interesting to see how um how his um, followers react to this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't think they'll be abandoning him about it. No, <laughs> no, that's, that's for sure, man. Yeah. So um, you can speak to that from this weekend, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> that was a, you want to just start at the beginning? Sure. Let's, let's kind of run through the convention. Like I want to, I want to hear some stuff. Okay. Um, what do you want to hear? <laughs> I, I mean, well, let's start with Trump. Like since we're, we're already on the Trump, yeah, okay. we're already on the subject. Uh, well, there was a huge controversy at the Libertarian Convention, mostly, I guess, along those faction lines about whether Trump should have been invited to speak yeah. at all. Um, I think that the the party made a couple of pretty major errors in relation to Trump's talk, uh, but having it was not one of them. Yeah. Uh, it... <laughs> It's amazing to me how many libertarians were acting exactly like the blue hair, septum piercing, whiny, liberal college women. Shout you down. Don't want to, won't even let you speak. Yeah. yeah. Um, like this is our place. We can't have him. Now, first off, uh, in fact, okay, so I, I gave an interview to CBS before the Trump speech. Um, so if you're curious, uh, you can probably Google Trump Libertarian CBS and find an article that where I'm quoted a fair bit at the very end. 
Yeah. <laughs> at the, but you were quoted more than anybody else was quoted. Yes. Um, yeah, so I was I surprised after I, after I gave the interview. I think I sent you a message and said, well, I just gave an interview to CBS. They won't use any of it because I'm too reasonable. Yeah. I was, uh, I was wrong. Yeah. So... Hats off to them. Props to the CIA broadcasting (laughs) system. Right. Um, Anyway, uh, the, okay. There were a lot of people that said, there was a quote in that article um, where a libertarian had said, you know, like, this is our place. We don't want people that aren't libertarians coming to our convention or something like that. Yeah. Um, I'm paraphrasing loosely, but essentially it was like, you know, we don't want people that don't think like us to come talk here. Yeah. So there's a couple of things. First off, Dr. Peter McCullough was also at the convention. I'm pretty sure he's not a libertarian. <laughs> yeah. I went to his talk. It was interesting. Nobody was complaining about Dr. McCullough being there. Yeah. I didn't hear a single complaint <laughs> about McCullough being there. Yeah. People were only complaining about RFKJ and Trump. And not so many people were even complaining about RFKJ. Trump was the big one. Yeah. I mean, there were there were plenty of people complaining about RFKJ, but not not like, like Trump. Trump. Yeah, um, which to me is just evidence that the you know Trump derangement sin- syndrome infects people everywhere, including the Libertarian Party. It's it's rampant, um, and it's not like he was speaking on the floor of the convention. Like he wasn't yeah. speaking at the convention itself. It was a it was a side talk. Yeah. Like, it was something that was available to do. Yeah, you didn't have to go. Yeah, if you don't want to hear him speak, don't go. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, this, this was strictly voluntary. Nobody was making anybody go listen to Trump. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it didn't happen on, on the convention floor. It wasn't during business or whatever. It was after hours. It was just, it yeah. was like the comedy show that they put on, except that it was Trump. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he wasn't that funny this time, which I was a little disappointed. He had a few moments. There were moments, but he, you know, it wasn't like going to a stand up show, which oh, is well, kind of yeah. how I. <laughs> what you anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I think it was good for the Libertarian Party to invite him. I expressed that before on this podcast. Um, I think that it it could have been very valuable for the Libertarian Party um, in a few ways. And this is one of the ways where we screwed up. It was an opportunity with one of the most influential people in the world standing in front of us, saying what he had done and what he planned to do, for us to be very clear to him about what we liked and what we didn't like. Yeah. It would have been very easy to sit back and respectfully listen to what he had to say, and when he said something that we liked, to cheer, and when he said something that we he we didn't like, to boo. Yeah. It it really kind of reminds me of when you're like in the first or second grade mm-hmm. and like the teacher has that conversation with the class. Like if you if they say something you like, let them know and cheer. If mm-hmm. they say something you don't like, boo. Yeah. But like, but be respectful. Like, mm-hmm. like it really reminds me of something. And it's crazy to me that libertarians couldn't take that small piece of advice. And yeah. they were definitely getting it because Dave Smith had, um, from what I understand, I wasn't there, mm-hmm. um, had had this, um, put out a video and said something in one of his talks about exactly that. Yeah. It's like, we need to send a message here mm-hmm. and a message of what we like and what we don't like. And make it very clear. Yes. And because of the jeering and the constant booing and the heckling, it was yeah. muddied. Yeah. Um, Angela McArdle also got up there and said... Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah. I don't know. It, so that was a, a huge mistake. I think um, he was, I, I don't think, I don't think Trump was quite prepared for the reception that he got. Yeah. Uh, and I do well, want to set the scene here too, because it wasn't just like a room full of libertarians. Yeah. About half the room was people that were there for the libertarian convention. And then half the people were there for Trump. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess they had extra seats available. Uh, well, I'm sure Trump was made it a point to make sure some of his people had access. Yeah. So like half the room was MAGA. And um, I, I will say I was kind of surprised at the fanaticism. Yeah. 
I, I was. I guess I hadn't. Dude, I'd I hadn't love to been... go to a Trump rally. Like I know he's came down here a handful of times, and I've never made it. But yeah. like I always say, I want to go just to see it, like on display. Yeah, I was surprised at the number of like little kids in like dressed up in Trump gear. Yeah, um, <laughs> were there. Uh, I will add that conservative women are hot. <laughs> yeah, and they're actually women, so there's that too. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be confused. <laughs> you don't have to um, guess. <laughs> yeah, the I don't know. It's a lot of <laughs> lot of attractive conservative women there. A mm. um, lot, uh, a lot of blacks, a lot of Indians or Pakistani or something. You know, yeah. somewhere over there, Middle East subcontinent. Middle East. Yeah, yeah, that area. Um, so it's not like it was a whole bunch of white nationalists there. This is D.C. Yeah. yeah. All right. Pretty mixed bag. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of white people. <laughs> yeah. Well. But I, I bet the I bet the there was more diversity in. I don't know. I I hesitate to say this. It certainly wasn't less diverse than the Libertarian Party delegates. Yeah. Like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and there were a lot more women. <laughs> hey, well, there you go. <laughs> Maybe I'm a conservative after all. Yeah. <laughs> MAGA all the way. Yeah. Um, so there, all right. As for what he had to say, um, I, obviously he was there to pitch the libertarian party. Uh, his idea that we would nominate him as the, as our presidential candidate was ridiculous. He, he doesn't qualify. And even if he did, yeah. like that I wasn't going to happen. It's, it's still Trump though. Like he's got to try like, and sure. And, and but I, I did think it was, is, I think it was distasteful for him to, to try for the nomination. Yeah. Like asking but for asking votes is one thing but, was, was, was the way to go. He yeah. should have just stuck with that. Yeah. Um, um <laughs> interestingly, RFKJ did qualify yeah. to be a nominee and didn't ask. And didn't ask. No, he didn't ask. Yeah. Um, he also was uh, rejected on the first ballot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and Trump would have been too. Oh, without question. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's was, not why you're here, buddy. That was a complete. That was a complete waste of time. Now, I do think that Trump will probably. You you see the reaction that the the Libertarian Party gave, and I, I again I want to be fair. Like the the jeers and and heckling and so forth. That was a minority of the Libertarians. I'm sure. I mean, the boos weren't. There were plenty yeah. of boos from like depending on what he was talking about. Yeah. Um. But the the jeers and the heckling was a minority. I I don't know this, but I. I know that back along those faction lines again. Yeah. It was the the Mises Caucus leadership of the Libertarian Party, the new leadership of the Libertarian Party since 2022, yeah. that invited Trump and RFKJ. Yeah. And there was some resentment about that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the old guard had invited those people, if the reaction would have been the same. But since the Mises Caucus did, it was. Pretty. It was. A, there was some it resistance. It was a divisive issue. Yeah. Um, within the Libertarian Party. Yeah. And again, back to how ridiculous it is for the Libertarian Party to say that we don't want to hear what somebody has to say. Yeah. How hypocritical <sighs> is that? <laughs> so, um, it was a minority. The leadership of the Libertarian Party, including the leadership of the Mises Caucus, if for those of you out there that just think that this is a Mises Caucus screw up that are like kind of engaged with the libertarian party all urged against the kind of reaction that yeah that trump got yeah um with the jeers and the heckling and so forth yeah so uh he offered to put a libertarian in the cabinet which would be awesome well it would be awesome the real problem with that is if you listen to that whole speech, it's very questionable whether or not he knows exactly what a libertarian is. Uh -huh. So in all likelihood, if if he does fulfill that, there's a good chance it's going to be somebody that we're like, that dude ain't no libertarian. Like Rand Paul. <laughs> I'd take that, though. Hey, I, honestly, I, so honest to too. goodness, if he puts Rand Paul in, I'll ca I ca it counts. I'm good with <laughs> close it. Close enough. Yeah, that's close <laughs> enough, man. Because yeah. I'm worried it's going to be somebody far from that. Yeah. Um, well, this this um, libertarian journalist that he kept referring to that he quoted extensively from yes. the article that I didn't see. I've never heard of this guy. Ne I never heard of this guy. And apparently, yeah. from what I understand, 
Um, nobody had heard of this guy, and he he hasn't really wrote a whole lot about libertarianism. But he wrote this article, and yeah. Trump got a hold of it and ran with it. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if that guy's a libertarian or not, but it didn't sound like it from what he quoted from the article. No, exactly. Um, so. so, yes, that's that's the concern. That's the yeah. secondary concern. The first, the primary concern is, like, can you trust him to do that anyway? Well, that's, yeah, that's the rule. Well, because he, he's made a lot of promises. Oh, yeah, yeah. He made a lot of promises before he went into office the first time. Yeah. And only... There were a handful that he kept, as far yeah. as I can tell. Yeah. And I keep hearing from Trump supporters, like, well, he keeps his promises. He does what he says he's going to do. And his, my question is, like, what? Yeah. Show me on paper. <laughs> like, like give me, show me the timeline of, of, of promises kept. <laughs> yeah. Because... So. The only promises that I remember him keeping is the ones that I wish he hadn't kept. Right. It, it falls under Scott Horton's law yeah. uh, of the, any president when elected will keep all the bad promises and, and never enact any of the good promises that they made. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Um, I did get to talk to him for a moment. Uh, yeah. Scott Horton. That was cool. Yeah. It's nice to see him again. Um, but uh, so libertarian in the cabinet Libertarians in positions of power in the executive branch. That would be great. Yeah. Um, question is, does he know who those people are? He couldn't He couldn't identify people that would support his policies when he was in office the first time. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Well, and that's the biggest complaint. And we talked about it a bunch through his presidency. Um, that was our biggest complaint about him was that that he did put the wrong people in positions of power. Yeah. Like that, that, and that I felt like a lot of t the time his heart would be in the right place and he wanted to do the right things. He just d wasn't educated enough to know who the people are to put there yeah. and how to move the levers of power to make these things happen. Right. Um, so, I mean, it is worth noting that if, if he really did mean what he said and he's going to talk to some libertarians and put them in positions of power, this man could be swayed in the right direction. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's worth, it's worth a hope. <laughs> um, he, I don't remember him saying anything about pardoning Snowden or dropping charges against Assange. I didn't like, hear that. I was the there. Speech. I listened to that speech. I don't remember hearing that, but I saw in a news article they said that he'd said that. I it's so possible, it's possible I missed it. It's possible I missed it too, but I did not catch that. But I don't know how I could have missed it because that that room would have erupted. Yeah. Well, and so he did say he will he will um, free Ross. Yes, he did um, say he would free Ross Ulbrick. Yeah. Um, for those that don't know, Ross Ulbrick. Uh, built the Silk Road. Yeah, uh, which website. is amazing how many people don't know about that. By the way, because this week, as I've talked to people, I've had to educate a lot of people mm -hmm. on that. And I get not knowing the name, but like I've, a lot of people didn't know what Silk Road was either. So yeah, well, um, <laughs> like the original Silk Road, like no, from China, to, like okay. the one where the the website. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so this was a website. The guy built infrastructure to for people to make anonymous exchanges, transactions, anonymous transactions. Um, the money was secured until the exchanges were made is actually like, it's actually really brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, now I tried to explain this to my mom and she was like, he's just a drug dealing criminal. I was like, well, he didn't deal drugs. He just built a platform where that, that was people, one of the things that yeah, happened. And yeah. it wasn't all illegal activity that was going on on that website. Of course, there was illegal activity on that website because it was anonymous and it was secure. Yeah, yeah. But that's not all that was going on there. And that's like holding Jeff Bezos responsible for people selling drugs on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that doesn't make Jeff Bezos a drug dealer. Yeah. Well, and at any rate... The man doesn't deserve to spend life in prison yeah. over this. Like he's, he's already sure. spent eleven years in prison, and he got a lifetime sentence without parole for this. Yeah, like um, so for being a clever entrepreneur, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I mean, I think a a, um, a time spent is is fair because that's what Trump said he would do was would commute him to time spent. Yes, and and I think that's fair. Like, because I'm I actually. And I may be a I'm, I'm a libertarian as much as anybody, but in the real world, yeah, 
I get that he needed to probably spend a little time for what he did. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't agree with it, but I can understand that. Yeah. But life is in, is just absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm definitely good with that. And a lot of people, a lot of libertarians have, have really been like, well, do you really trust Trump to do that? Um, and I'll say on this one, like the libertarian in the cabinet, I'm a little sketchy on, yeah. like we just talked about, but I think he'll follow through with that. This one costs him nothing. It's nothing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's he can do it. It's, there's He's well within his presidential powers the to do it. The people that would be really upset about it don't know who Ross Ulbricht is anyway. Exactly. Like, <laughs> I, I do think that that's one, if elected, he'll follow through on. Maybe. Um, um, and if that happens, then inviting him to the convention was worth it. Yeah. Uh, that alone is paid the bill. Yeah. Um, a libertarian in the cabinet, libertarians in positions to power of the executive branch, yeah. free, uh, commuting Ross Ulbricht sentence, pardoning, um, Edward Snowden, dropping yeah. charges against Julian Assange. If he does any of these things. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't think that he can actually do this in a way that it sticks, but if he even tries, um, to write an executive order or whatever, prohibiting, uh, the establishment of CBDC. Uh, yeah. Of central bank digital currencies. Yeah. Oh, he talked um, about that too. Yeah. Uh, that got a good reaction. No, um, and he, and he I was think talking he's about serious the, uh, about that one. Um, um, protecting individual ownership of uh, crypto. Yep. Yep. Oh well, Bitcoin. Yes, yeah, specifically. He used, he used it specifically, but um, I mean, it applies across the board. Um, so you don't have to have it in, uh, registered in an exchange or a bank or whatever. Like you could, yeah. like as personal property, you can have it, yeah. which takes it out of the government's hands. Yeah. Um, if, if he does any one of these things, yeah, it was worth inviting him to the convention. Oh, absolutely. And the crypto thing, I think you may see that from him anyway, because yeah. he's actually talked about that sum on the stump. Yeah. Um, um, Vivek was talking in his speech, Vivek was talking about how he had, or maybe it was in the Q and a afterwards. I don't remember, but, um, he was talking about how he had talked to Trump about this yeah. and that Trump wasn't educated, didn't really know what it was. And Vivek explained the whole thing to him and Trump was like, Whoa, no, I, you know, yeah, no, cause I listened to one of the speeches after Vivek had talked to him and, yeah. and when he talked about it, the crowd erupts. He's like, it was this reaction like, Oh, y'all talked to Vivek too. <laughs> 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 y'all know about this. Nice. So um, anyway. Yeah, and nobody was complaining about Vivek being there either. Yeah. As far as I could tell. I like I didn't hear anybody complaining about Vivek. Yeah. He's not a libertarian. He used to be though. Yeah. He gave a speech at the Libertarian Convention years ago. I think it was the one in New Orleans, so that would have been twenty eighteen. Yeah. Um at one of the lunch speeches that I was there for, and I was like, oh, is this guy i didn't know who he was then yeah. and i was like that was a good speech and he was libertarian then he's not anymore yeah um and he's talked about issues that pushed him away from the party yeah but he's still leaning yeah sure. oh yeah yeah he's he's more libertarian than most yeah absolutely he's more libertarian than some of the libertarians <laughs> uh yeah but he's got his he's got his issues he's a china hawk yeah um he's a border hawk too i think he is um, but I've met some libertarians that feel that way. I was going to say well, the border so. thing is, is yeah. fair as far oh, as yeah. I'm concerned. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, inviting Trump there was, it was absolutely well worth it. And I'll tell you, listening to the speech, cause I listened to it shortly after he gave it as soon <laughs> as I could find it. Um, and it really did the way he was treated there really kind of offended me as yeah. a libertarian, because I've been a libertarian a long time and I don't, Feel, I feel like enough people don't hear our message. And for us to be put on the platform and have an opportunity for people like this to, to hear our message. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the least, a bunch of Trump supporters were at a libertarian convention yeah. and they heard more than just Trump there. Well, that that's another issue. Um, but And I'll get to that, too. That was our other big mistake. Yeah. Um, but it, it, the other aspect of that first one of not being clear, like the jeers and the heckling muddling our message about what we liked and didn't like. Yeah. That was the other part of that is that a lot of people watched that speech. Yeah. yeah. And if we had been under control, 
then everybody out there would have also heard what we like and don't like. Exactly. Gets our message out there because that's, I think when it comes to the messaging, we just get in our own way. We're right about so much stuff. And there's so many people out there who I think are leaning libertarian and don't realize it. Um, And we're just, we got to get out of our own way with some of that. Yeah. uh, That was not a time for a purity test. Yeah. 100%. That's a good way to put it. There's not a time for a purity test um, because it just made us look ridiculous to a lot of people. And the, and the truth is that the people who, who watched that, who would be receptive to our message, they're not anymore. Yeah. Or turned off. Yeah. And what's so, and that leads to the second thing. Yeah. All right. So we're going to have to back up a little bit and talk about um, our presidential nominees. Yeah. So we had not selected a presidential candidate um, at the time of the Trump speech. That didn't happen until Sunday. The speech was on Saturday. Yeah. The presidential nominations were Sunday. Yeah. So um, they had a few of the front runners speak, or, well, they had a few of the front runners do a press conference afterwards. And they had one of the front runners speak beforehand. Yeah. Um, and uh, the front runner for the VP nomination also spoke beforehand. Yeah. That was Clint Russell, Liberty Lockdown. Um, yeah. I, all right. So the person who was selected to speak before the Trump uh, speech was Michael Rechtenwald. He was the Mises Caucus candidate. Yeah. For the <laughs> presidential nomination. Yeah. And I've always. I, like I have mixed feelings about this guy. Um, he's a professor. He's a former communist, socialist, Marxist mm-hmm. at the very least. Like this mirrors a lot of me. I didn't end up being a college professor, but everybody thought I was going to be. <laughs> right. Um, Still not too late. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't, I don't have interest now. Um, he he is able to express uh, the libertarian message effectively. He un- I mean, like I, I agree with and him he understands wise. it through and through. Yeah, um, um, I agree with all of that. He's I, before the convention. I thought he was boring. Yeah, that was my primary concern with him is that he just doesn't get people excited. He's boring. That that was that was my biggest complaint as well. Like it just he he just like I listened to him a few times on some different podcasts and I was like I just don't feel it when I listen to him mm-hmm. and that's important. Um, yes, I mean it's not everything, but it is important. It, it, especially for us. Yeah. Because the, the, let me also explain my understanding of what the role of the Libertarian Party presidential candidate is at this point. Yes. We know we're not going to win. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's now, now political change happens really fast. So yeah. the truth is that like something crazy could happen. Yeah. And the Libertarian Party could win. But, but it's it, going to take the right candidate for yeah. that to even be... Uh, and it's not likely. I don't feel that yet. No. Like, maybe in another four years. Yeah. Or eight years or something. It, it could happen that quickly, is what, what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we've generated the kind of movement that we'd like. We haven't pushed the Overton window out enough but yet. But things like Trump coming could be those catalysts. Exactly. Like, that's the reason I was so excited about him coming. Like, it's not all going to happen at one time, but like, this could be one of those, could have been one of those moments that we look back on. Yes. You know? Yeah. So, um, at the convention, my concerns about him being boring were kind of wiped away. He, yeah. somebody would obviously been working with him or he'd been working at it. I imagine somebody has yeah. been working with him. Um, he was, he was a firebrand. Yeah. During the convention, during really? the debates and his other speeches and so forth. He's like... Just excitable diff- just different yeah yeah just yeah. um yeah really fiery and uh sounded like a radical yeah i, I mean like what you'd expect well, like what we want yeah yeah i mean well the things he had to say were always radical but yeah. the way he was saying them now also he had, made him he got a cater like a radical yeah yeah some other things i mean he still didn't look totally comfortable with that yeah um and he has some weird ticks that yeah. I, I can't really explain. You'd have to see. Yeah. Um, but he, he does something weird with his hand um, where he's like, you know, like shaking something almost or rubbing something in his hand. Like it's, it's like he's shaking his hand and rubbing a lucky rabbit's foot at the same time, but there's nothing there. You know, he's <laughs> yeah. just like doing it. Yeah. Um, and uh, he keeps licking his lips in a weird way. It's very reptilian, which is kind of distra- <laughs> these things distract me. Yeah. It's, it's like those, uh, those, um, 
linguistic tics that people do. Like, you know what I'm saying? Or the, yeah. like, 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 <laughs> like, like, like. I'm bad like. about that one. So, like, I'm bad about that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I do the ums, but it's because I'm trying to prevent you from speaking while I'm finishing my thought. <laughs> Fair enough. Because I'm bad about that, right? <laughs> exactly. Interrupt me all the time. Yeah. So those those kind of physical tics also distract me. Yeah. I, I, I notice them, and I find them incredibly distracting. So then I was kind of on the fence about them, but I'm a Mises Caucus guy. I, yeah. At least I was. Uh, and... So I was still kind of leaning towards Rechtenwald, but I was on the fence about it. Then he gave an opening talk before Trump's speech. Yeah. Completely lost me. Yeah. Because like I said, the role of the Libertarian Party presidential candidate is should be to be the chief marketing agent yeah. for the Libertarian Party. Through the time of the, the cycle that People are paying the most political attention. Yeah, you've got six months to deliver our message to yeah. non-libertarians in a way that they understand and is appealing. Yep. That's your job. That's it. They're listening right now. Now's your chance. Give yep. them as much information as you can yep. and make it appealing to them. So here we are. This is a room of half libertarians and half MAGA Republicans before yep. a Trump speech. Yeah. And he starts off his talk with, or his remarks with, None of us are fans of Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that was actually the first thing he said. Wow. Yeah. So then there's half the room just goes, huh. Yeah. Okay. And stops listening. <laughs> yeah. Now he shouldn't have been, he should have understood his role there. Yeah. He shouldn't have been talking to the libertarians. He yeah. should have been talking to the MAGA Republicans. Yeah. He should have, there's plenty of overlap in policy. Plenty. Uh, he could have talked about um, ending the wars. He could have talked about ending the Fed. He could have talked about the deep state framing Donald Trump for treason for four years. He could have tra- talked about a number of things where MAGA Republicans would be like, oh, okay, these guys are all right. And let me yeah. tell you something else, is that the MAGA Republicans are not your average everyday Republicans. No, they are not. Your MAGA Republicans are, are now— it turns out that their guy is actually pretty mainstream, but they they're with Donald Trump because they think he's outside of the political sphere. Yeah. They think he's an outsider, even yeah. if he's not. Yeah. And so what happens in four years or maybe this year, if he doesn't win, yeah. like what happens to the MAGA Republicans when Trump's no longer in the picture? Where do they go? Do yeah. you think that they go to the Republican party? That, that's that ships done sell. Like they don't, they don't go back to the Republican party as it stands. Um, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, I, th- I think the same thing. So give them another option. Yeah. Show them how much like them we are. In fact, even better. Yeah. Show them, say, yeah, we were all on board with Donald Trump ending all the wars. It's a shame that his generals lied to him about troops in Syria. It's a yeah. shame that, uh, that Joe Biden didn't follow through with Trump's plan to get the troops out of Afghanistan when he did. Instead, l- delayed them there and got a bunch of people killed that were unnecessary. Yeah. There's a whole lot of things. And you know what? It wouldn't have taken us, if you elect libertarians, you want to end the wars? You want to bring the troops home? Elect libertarians, we, because Trump said that he wanted to do that, but he kept the wars going throughout his presidency. Yeah. He didn't start any new wars, and that's great. But you know what we would have done? We would have ended the wars that we were involved in. Exactly. Really this is how you make back in. Y- yeah, this is how you make the case to them. If you're going to insult Trump in any way, say that he was good on this, but you know what? We're, we're even better. We're better. Yeah. Absolutely. And I tell you, like, cause I talk to a lot of MAGA people, um, they're plugged in and they, mm-hmm. and they're sympathetic to our message. Like, I mean, my experience is they get a lot of the economic stuff wrong, but the, the rest of the stuff, they're pretty well there because with they're protectionist, they're protectionist. And you know, we'll get to that when we get to it, but mm-hmm. let's, let's work on what we agree on. Yeah. Um, like these people are, are obtainable. Like I haven't we can had get this them. whiskey in a really long time. It's really good. It is good. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm digging it. <laughs> I might have to pause and go pour another glass, man. <laughs> I hear you. Um, so that's he. And in fact, okay, so there was a guy sitting next to me that was a libertarian. On the other side of him was a MAGA couple. Yeah. Um, o- older gentleman and his wife. Yeah. And when, <laughs> 
So when Rechtenwald started off with his none of us are fans of Donald Trump and then insulted him for two minutes or whatever. Donald Trump, I mean. Yeah. Um, at first, the the MAGA husband uh, turns to us and he says, is he trying to make a joke or what is this? And and <laughs> I guess ever the diplomat, the libertarian sitting next to me says, I think he's being sarcastic, <laughs> but it became... Clear, pretty, pretty clear quickly he wasn't, yeah. that he yeah that he wasn't being sarcastic and that guy sat back in his chair and crossed his arms yeah. and did not move from that position the rest of the time libertarians were talking he yeah. shut down he yeah. was no longer listening because they were here to see their guy and mm-hmm. all we had to say about him was how terrible he was yeah and th- so it was a huge screw up Shouldn't have been talking to us. Should have been talking to the MAGA Republicans. That was a wasted opportunity. So then Clint Russell got up there and had better things to say. And then Dave Smith... Oh, thank God for Dave Smith. Then Dave Smith got up there and gave a very good talk about focusing on what we're agreed upon and actually did comment on how um, the deep state that we all hate had framed Donald Trump for years. And, uh, you know, why... um, the, this guy that we're supporting here, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, you remember the day after the election, he was the first par- person to call Joe Biden and congratulate him. Yeah. This guy. Yeah. Um, no friend of Donald Trump's, really, is he? Yeah. And, you know, so on. Like, he gave a good talk. And actually, at the end of it, even though that, even though MAGA husband yeah. um, sat there with his arms crossed, pushed back in his chair the whole time, yeah. when Dave Smith was done with his, his talk and, and left the mic, he said, He's a good speaker. Yeah. <laughs> so so something got through. There. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That but should Rechtenwald, have been our, our candidate. Yeah. yeah. Rechtenwald screwed it up royally. And yeah. at that point, I was like, he does not understand what his job is. Yeah. And so I cannot, cannot vote for this guy to be the libertarian nominee for president. And yeah. I didn't. Not yeah. once. Not on yeah. a single ballot did I vote for Rechtenwald. Yeah. Um, and then... Uh, after that, he oh uh, apparently I missed this because yeah. I, I went upstairs to change clothes because somebody spilled a drink on me <laughs> um, during the the Trump speech. He, but, he he says that, but he got in a fight. <laughs> I didn't get in a fight. I almost got in a fight, not with the guy that spilled the drink on me actually. Though. Yeah, and it was a libertarian that I almost got in a fight with too. So I wasn't yeah. going to talk about that on the podcast. Yeah. I'm going to leave that. Um, that's just stupidness. I apologize to the guy afterwards. He apologized back. Everything's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'd gone upstairs to change. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I missed the libertarian rebuttal press conference thing. Yeah. Um, where apparently Rechtenwald sat and answered a couple of questions and then got up and left before it was over saying, I'm not going to keep beating the same drum or something. I don't know. Yeah. And, and left it like, no, you have to be able to deal with the press if right. you're going to be the libertarian. That's literally the job. This like, is where our huge mistake with Gary Johnson. Actually, that wasn't our mistake with Gary Johnson, but that's one of the things that he screwed up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Was his inability to deal with the press, especially an antagonistic press. Yeah. I thought he would be good at that because he'd already had experience, but not an antagonistic press, Yeah, I guess. he had just dealt with the press. You yeah. Know? Um, so that was it. I was like, yeah, Rechtenwald clearly is not our guy. And... But this is where the faction factionalization of the Libertarian Party becomes a real problem. Yeah. Is because the Mises Caucus would not back off their guy. Yeah. And so afterwards, everybody, I think it was, it should have been clear to everybody yeah. that that's not our guy, that yeah. he can't be our nominee, that he, we, he can't do this effectively. We yeah. need to choose somebody else. And yeah. there were a bunch of people that night yeah. Running around trying to make deals. Yeah. Like, hey, there's a couple of guys on this list of potential nominees that none of us really want, or well, like at least the more libertarian libertarians. Yeah. Um, don't want. Uh, we don't want one of these Gary Johnson type milk toast, middle of the road, you know, yeah. fiscally conservative, socially liberal. Yeah. Uh, I'm really a Democrat with good economics, you know, kind of libertarians. Yeah. We want a real la- radical libertarian that's going to push, yeah. push the envelope, push the Overton window. Yeah. Um, so we've got a few of those. Yeah. But the, you know, as people drop off, they kind of fall back towards the middle, like yeah. because the way it works in the Libertarian Party is that um, with each ballot, 
you eliminate the person with the lowest vote total or uh, anybody that's below 5%. Well, okay. really, everybody's above 5% after the first ballot, usually. Yeah. So we eliminated like three people on the first ballot, and then it was one at a time until they were all gone. Yeah. Now, during that time period, uh, Rechtenwald, the Mises Party, or the Mises Caucus candidate, as people dropped off the ballot, seven ballots, we did seven ballots to elect a president. I yeah. think. Maybe eight, but I think it was seven. Yeah. Um, which is partly why we were there, till 1 a.m. <laughs> With each one, the votes that went to the guy who get eliminated get distributed in some way to the remaining candidates. Yeah, because now you got to vote for somebody else. Yeah. Or Noda. Or Noda. And Noda is always on the ballot in, in libertarian, libertarian politics. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, we believe in that. Noda yeah. is none of the above. Yeah. All right. So, gosh, I wish we did that at the federal level. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, oh, the world would be a better place. <laughs> yeah. Then you wouldn't have to choose between two bad candidates. You could say... Uh, yeah. Republicans, Democrats, apparently we're going to choose one of you, but you got to go back and try again. Right. Find <laughs> exactly. somebody else. Find someone new. <laughs> so um, in during that time period, Rectonwall gained almost nothing. Yeah. Like a very small percentage of the vote moved to Michael Rectonwall after their primary candidate was eliminated. Yeah. And so in the end, we ended up with Chase Oliver. Yeah. I have some criticisms of this guy. I have criticisms of all of them, to be fair. Yeah. I mean, we're well, libertarians. Uh, I, like, there is no libertarian candidate that I agree with 100%. Well, no, and you're never going I mean, to. I would but, love it if Dave Smith had run. I mean, Dave Smith almost certainly would have won without much trouble so. if he if yeah. he had run. But even Dave Smith, who I absolutely adore as a libertarian candidate and as a personality in the space and so forth— I have issues with Dave Smith too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, th I mean, that's not really it, but the guy that we interviewed here, Mike Termot, who was on the ballot, who was on the ballot right up till the end. Yeah. And I think I like him. Like I say, of all of the candidates, I think that would have been my guy. That's who I voted for every round till he was gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he's a good solid libertarian. I have some issues with him, but especially to a non libertarian, that guy comes off as a radical and he speaks well and he presents well. He looks presidential. He can handle adversity. He's, he would be a good candidate. He's a good radical libertarian, um, that should have been perfectly acceptable to the Mises caucus. Yeah. And here's my big thing. He's, he's a libertarian that I could be proud of. That I could, whenever people, when I'm talking to people, be like, go look up our guy. Mm -hmm. Like, our guy is good. Yeah. And I don't feel like I've been able to say that for a long time. Yeah. Well. I mean, I pushed a lot of people towards Gary Johnson, because, especially I, I, in the yeah. first Gary Johnson run, because mm -hmm. I, wa I wasn't the biggest fan, but I was like, but I wasn't embarrassed by him. Yeah. I kind of was by the second round. Well, Gary Johnson is who shifted me about it, because I, I used to buy into the idea of, well, we need a guy that's just kind of acceptable to everybody. Yeah. Um, we don't we don't want to scare people. Yeah. Well, I've changed my mind about that. Yeah. I, you know, because I talk about it in other things where you, where, where people are, are making changes, where they're trying to push something outside of the existing boundaries. Yeah. Is that you need the radicals. The radicals are the vanguard. The radicals are the ones that get people talking mm -hmm. and thinking about something else, even if they're pissed off about it. Yeah, yeah. Or scared of it or whatever. But it introduces the ideas. You need the radicals out there to start moving things in the right direction. Yeah. And after the radicals go through and they set the stage, then you get your more, um, I don't know, polished. Yeah. No, no, no. Not even compromised, but polished yeah. people yeah. that aren't aren't the firebrands that, are, yeah. that come off as reasonable, but they're still talking about the same stuff. Yeah, yeah. But at the beginning, you got to shock people. Yeah. And so we're in, we're still there. Oh, like, yeah. We still have to oh, shock sure. people. Yeah. And a Gary Johnson absolutely doesn't do that. No. A Joe Jorgensen actually, I think, could have. Um, I mean, like I've met her and talked to her. Yeah. 
she's a good radical libertarian. She is, but she. But got, that campaign. The campaign is what turned me off, do. and yeah. that's that's the reason. And ultimately, I couldn't do it with her was because the the campaign was just so poorly managed. Yeah. I mean, um, you, and, you and had this, the best libertarian issue going on right at that time, and you barely talked about it. Yeah, yeah. It was not a central campaign issue, and I don't understand why lockdowns and mandates were not the <laughs> yeah. campaign it issue. Should have been all she talked about. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. the, like they handed it to you, mm-hmm. like so. So um, there were people running around trying to make co- uh, compromises with the Mises Caucus the night before. Yeah. Say, hey, look. Your guy screwed up. Like, yeah. people aren't going to be on board with this. But here, look at Mike Termont. He's yeah. a very good candidate. We'll support Mike Termont. You support Mike Termont. We'll get Mike Termont in there. Yeah. That that's, should have been what happened. But it isn't. Yeah. Because roughly a quarter of the room absolutely would not vote for anybody but Michael Rechtenwald. Rechtenwald, yeah. And in the end, in our last vote, because we do Noda to the end. Yeah. It was Chase Oliver versus Noda. Yeah. And so just as a background, if the Libertarian Party selects Noda on the presidential nomination, yeah. uh, if Noda gets 50 plus percent of the vote, in most elections in the Libertarian Party, if Noda wins, then it goes back to the start. You make new nominees. Yeah. The people that were nominated the first time are ineligible and you make new nominees and you go through the whole process again till you find somebody. Yeah. Not for the presidential candidate. Yeah. If Noda wins in the presidential nominations, we have no presidential candidate. Yeah. Apparently there was some confusion about that too, because in some of the groups I've listened to or been reading and, and just different groups that the idea was, was that if they were able to get Noda through that they would, that, I guess Angela, the hope would be that Angela was going to um, push through something. That the LNC would select a candidate well, or that, something? Well, that they would um, change the bylaws to do another ballot and with new nominees. And the idea was they wanted to try to get Spike or Dave to step in. Oh. Um, like that. So in the groups I'm in, I'm in a bunch of libertarian, like, like LNC groups. Mm-hmm. Um, like that's the understanding I have is like, that's what the people that were voting NOTA, that's what they were going after yeah. is that they wanted the, they wanted a new round of candidates, but it was going to take some hurdles to do that because it would have took a bylaw change. Yeah. And we already struggled with that enough in the weekend. Well, it, exactly. And it was already midnight. Yeah. So uh, start all over. We just spent six hours doing voting for that. Anyway. Yeah. No, uh, so nobody, I'm not, I'm nobody, not saying that it was justified. All yeah. I'm saying is that was the idea because a lot of people were really upset that no, the pulled the 35% uh, of the vote. Yeah. The, the, the vote that it pulled. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was upset about that. Yeah. And, and the truth is if they thought that they were going to try and push through a bylaw change and redo it at that point, they would not have gotten it. There were enough people that were done. That yeah. Had had enough Been there, there that were not going to vote for that just because they didn't want to spend another six hours. Yeah. I mean, I would have had to be leaving to the airport when we were done <laughs> voting. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, but if we had ended up with Spike or Dave, would it have been worth it? Uh, yes, absolutely. But Dave wouldn't have done it. I don't know that. that I don't know. You don't really think so after I, everything that had went down? No, I don't think so. Well, um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I don't think Dave is a is gonna be a for candidate that. for at least eight years. Yeah. I think his kids gotta be older before he's gonna Maybe. do that. Yeah. Um Spike, I don't know. Uh, I tell you, Spike didn't run. No, I know he didn't. I'll tell you what, what really, he gave a really good speech though. Yeah. What saddens me is hopefully on C-SPAN. I have, I mean, I know that we were being broadcast on C-SPAN when Spike gave his speech. So I hope people saw that because it was was good. Well, that's what really saddens me is that like, I wasn't impressed with any of the candidates we had. Um, and we've got a couple, we've got some, there's some good people in the movement. We need Mm. them to take that mantle. We need a spike or a Dave or somebody of that caliber to take the mantle and, and be our nominee. Yeah. Well, this is what I'll say about Chase. Um, I think that for a non-libertarian, Chase comes off as a radical libertarian. Yeah. And that's good. I agree with that. I do agree with that. It wasn't like selecting another Gary Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. He, he is a radical enough libertarian to kind of push the envelope, I think. Yeah. And 
He's run a governor campaign and a Senate campaign in Georgia. Yeah. He's got a campaign machine put together. He's got people that have experience now. Yeah. Um, he campaigns in all 50 states. So that I could have gone through the candidates one by one and told you what my problem with them was. Yeah. But uh, let me say that another good libertarian candidate that was running was Lars Mapstead. Yeah. Yeah. And, but Lars had a plan to just get the, um, to prevent Biden or Trump from getting the electoral votes they needed to win. Yeah. So his plan was to concentrate on a few states to try and pull those electoral votes to end up, to deny both uh, Trump and Biden 270. Yeah. Um, and have it thrown to the House of Representatives. Yeah. The problem is, of course, when it goes to the House of Representatives, they're going to pick one of those guys anyway. <laughs> yeah, they're not picking Lars. They're not picking the Libertarian, that's <laughs> yeah. for sure. So yeah. we're going to end up with somebody terrible anyway. But it would um, have made for some interesting media coverage. It would have made for some interesting media coverage if we'd gotten some electoral votes, definitely. But it also would have ruined... Um, our ballot, ballot access. access in all the other states. Which is the reason everybody was so upset about NOTA getting 36%. Yeah. Because 36, it, it looks like 36% of the um, delegates were ready to just burn down the party. Yes. Yes. Um, That's what I thought at the time. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I was like, you're so committed to your, your candidate that you're willing to let all the rest of us suffer yeah. to ruin ballot access for the entire country for the next four years. Yeah. So yeah, that that's why I was upset about yeah. it too. Um, I almost went and found somebody and said, "Look, I'm withdrawn from the Mises Caucus right now." Yeah, <laughs> I haven't. I mean, ideologically, I'm with those guys for the most part. I don't yeah. like how they manage the caucus. Yeah, I, I it's actually like surprisingly. Undemocratic. Collectivist. <laughs> yeah. right. And so that's, I mean, I always vote my conscience. Yeah. I, I don't care if the Mises guys are holding up signs, yes, no, whatever, telling people what to vote. Yeah. I'm going to vote what I think is the right way to vote. Yeah. And if I don't understand what we're voting about, now I can understand it in situations like you get into those weird, like, parliamentary rules and you got to, um, an amendment wrapped up in a motion with another amendment with the changing of wording and this and blah. I mean, it can get really complicated. Yeah. And so I understand why you might need somebody to say, look, I know you don't understand what's going on at this point because very few people do. You yeah. practically have to be a parliamentarian to know what it is that we're voting on right now. Yeah. Or, or what the, what the results mean for the next couple of votes or whatever. So just, Instead take, of me trying to word. explain yeah. to you what's happening here, just vote yes. Yeah. Take our word. You, yeah. But most votes are pretty easy to understand. Pretty clear cut. Yeah. You don't need somebody holding up a sign every time. Yeah. Let people figure it out for themselves. Yeah. Do they want to change the motion or do they want to approve the motion or not? It's yeah. a very easy question. Do we want to go ahead and take a vote on this? Do we want to add this amendment? It's a single amendment to a single you know what anyway generally not that complicated yeah and even me when i oh whoops um even me when i don't understand what's going on like i've got people around me that i can ask yeah well I mean, it's fortunate for you they're most meacocks too <laughs> well that's true too um but it's but the alabama mises caucus isn't a block vote yeah i wouldn't expect it to be the Tennessee Mises Caucus seemed to be a block vote. Did it? Yeah. I yeah. I want to say that when I was looking at those vote totals uh, round after round, it was 22 people in one thing and zero in everything else. Wow. Yeah. So That's they were, ridiculous. They were lockstep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't understand how that happens in a libertarian vote for anything. <laughs> anything, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, this guy, Chase Oliver, I I think he's got bad instincts. And this is why I don't like him as a candidate. He he still has a trust in the institutions. And I think that that is a problem for a libertarian. Yes. Um, because he was wrong on COVID at the beginning. He was wrong on Ukraine. Two years ago, I sat at a table with him at our state convention. 
and argued with him about Ukraine because he was up there saying, we've got to support Ukraine. We've got to prevent Russia from taking over all of Europe. And I told him he was an idiot. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's ridiculous. What even makes you think that they want to do that, let alone could? could. Yeah. All right. And I argued with him for a half an hour. Well, now he's good on Ukraine. And now yeah. he's good on COVID, too, as far as I know. Yeah. But he wasn't when it started. No. And so that bothers me about him. He if, has if too there's much some of a major trust. crisis that comes out, chances are, it seems to me, that he's going to choose the wrong side at the beginning. Yeah. He'll find his way to the right answer. Great. Yeah. But I want the guy that comes to the right answer at the beginning, not a guy that eventually finds it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but... His campaign machine, I think, is valuable, and yeah. he campaigns in all 50 states, and he's already campaigned in all 50 states. So yeah. that's good for down-ballot libertarians. Yeah. Um, and they already have experience with this. They know where they're going. They have people that they've uh, had contacts with, etc. So I think that that's good for us. And for an outsider, he looks like a good radical libertarian. Yeah. I, I agree with all of that. The, the problem I have with him, and it's one that I just don't know that I can get past, is the trans stuff. He's Oh, yeah, because he's gay. He's gay. Well, I don't, that's not the problem. The well, fact that he's, he's gay isn't the problem. That's true. Um, the, he's, he's very pro <laughs> the trans, like yeah. all, all of the trans agenda he's in bed with. Mm -hmm. um, well, he came from the left. And some of those issues are still there. And that's probably why he has some trust in the institutions still. Yeah. I mean, maybe. Um, but it's just, it's really hard for me as a libertarian to point to my libertarian candidate when, when people ask and know that when they dig into this guy, they're going to see all of that. Well, I get that. One thing I'll say, though, is that he made a really good point on how he was going to focus his campaign on younger people. Yeah. And he said, in that room of libertarians, yeah. he said, how many of you became libertarian between the ages of 18 and 35? Uh, I would, I, and that was almost everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he's like, that's where I'm focusing. You got to get them while they're still young. That's when you can radicalize somebody in this way. Yeah. I mean, the communists know it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, but but we've got a philosophy that doesn't like you know punish you for not being part of the collective. Right. In fact, we reward that. Yeah. Um. So focusing on um, Gen Z and the millennials, the Zoomers and the millennials, I think is actually good because it introduces them to the ideas early. Yeah. And that's really all it takes. Like if you start down this path, yeah, you're probably continuing down this path. Yeah. Either no. that or you become a Nazi. <laughs> well, and then there's that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I want to be optimistic, and I, I'm going to reserve my um, my opinion. Like I say, I'm, I'm open to him running a good, solid campaign that I can be proud of. Mm -hmm. Like, I hope that's the case. Yeah. Um, like Because I, I want that. Like, and I he's want got that Mike Termont as his running mate. And Mike Termont's the and, VP. And I like Mike Termont. Mm -hmm. So... Like I say, I hope that I hope that this goes well. Yeah. Like I, I want it to. I don't want to be one of those guys because there's a lot of libertarians on the internet right now mm -hmm. that's that's shitting on this guy, and I don't want to be that. But I did want to be honest with our listeners about who this guy is and what he represents. Yeah. Um. And I like I say, I hope I hope he runs a good campaign. Um. I just I'm not. I just I will say I, I've got my reservations about it. So. Yeah, um, I just hope if there's some major crisis that comes out before he says anything, he talks talks to Mike Termont. Yeah, well, he's <laughs> he's got him there. Maybe, uh, like I say, I mean that's that's a lot, you know. Um, may, maybe this will turn out good. I don't know, but yeah, um, I, I like the idea of promoting libertarianism to young people now. Uh, and he's he presents well. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's been my understanding. I mean, I haven't watched a whole lot of his stuff. I mean, we had term. He speaks well. He, he looks respectable. He, yeah, I think. I mean, I went, I did go to his website fine. and, um, I didn't watch any videos of him, but I went through his platform on his website. Um, his, his platform's good. There's a, a couple of one, the only thing in there I really took issue with, and it's not a deal breaker issue for me was the um abortion issue mm. like he's he's pretty pro abortion yeah um but to me that's just not one of those those issues yeah 
You well, know? I mean, that that, it's a... important to me. Like, it, I don't want to come off that it doesn't matter to me. Mm-hmm. But it's one that I think you can have good faith, faith arguments on both sides right. and that I'm not going to not vote for somebody over it. Mm-hmm. I'm just not. It's like the border, same thing. Good I, I feel that way with the border. Both sides. Yeah, I, yeah, I completely agree. Um, I, I think that he'll be fine. I'm yeah. not excited about it. Yeah. But uh, it could have been. It's it's better than a Gary Johnson. Yeah. Um. At least it's somebody who, for the most part, is going to present libertarian I- ideology effectively and yeah appropriately. If he can focus on that and stay away from the other, like I'll I'll be happy. Yeah. Like I like I will. Well, you know, the libertarian candidate probably should, as a rule, at least right now, avoid divisive issue, issues anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, we're already promoting divisive issues. Yeah, so, I, yeah. <laughs> Stick to the libertarian ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. talk about ending wars and militarism. Talk about um, reining in law enforcement and uh, giving more people more choices. Yeah. And economics in the Fed, stop inflation, stop spending us into oblivion. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. That, that gets plenty of people excited uh, to vote for you yep. if you got the right answers on those. And I think that most of America at this point is on our side with a lot of these things. Yeah. Well, and there's not really, a, I mean, it, even with Israel, like he's going to be the only, um, candidate that's good on that yeah that's true i mean he is like well maybe i mean another minor party candidate may, might be like be, green party candidate green or something party, yeah yeah um which they're running jill stein again are they i guess so i saw okay i was a little irritated so i saw a well thing. she's definitely anti uh anti-war in gaza yeah um no but what irritated me was they they um one of the channels I was watching was running the numbers for a four-person race. Mm-hmm. Guess who wasn't in that four-person race? The Libertarian. The Libertarian. They had Jill Stein and... Um, RFKJ uh, and Trump and yeah, Biden. Yeah, yeah. It was all of them. It was not... Yeah, it was crazy. No, mm-hmm. maybe it was a five-person because they had the other guy too. Um, uh, oh, what is his name? I don't the, have any idea. Who the communist about. guy the with the hair. Oh, uh... Cornell West. Cornell West. Yeah, they had Cornell West listed, but not the Libertarian. Mm. I was like, what are these people doing? Like, yeah. <laughs> well, of we're going to get our 3%. <laughs> I mean, like, if you're going for a, an alternate candidate, um, RFKJ beats Jill Stein and Cornell West hands down. Oh, they did. Yeah. And that's how they had it. They actually had, um, they had um, RFK at like 14%, 13%, yeah. maybe. I um, didn't even talk about his speech. We're already an hour and 10 minutes in, though, so um, I'll just say very briefly, uh, he, t- he took a very safe tack. Um, yeah. He talked about uh, the Bill of Rights yeah, and his pledge to uh, uphold and defend the Bill of Rights, every word of it, if elected president. So that was a pitch to the libertarians about the Second Amendment. Yeah, that was because that's the one we've criticized him on the most. Yeah. Uh, he did also say, he didn't say anything about uh, Ross Ulbricht, but he yeah. did say that he would um, pardon Snowden and uh, drop charges against Assange. Yeah, yeah. So that was the, that was the other concession, but he's that been was, on that for a long for time. A like, that's, that's not that's for not the libertarians. For yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, well, what, what impresses me about him is at least he knew the audience he was talking to. Yeah. Because I don't feel like Trump did. Yeah, that, that might be true. <laughs> I I will say like being in the room with him like listening to a speech live yeah. uh, from RFKJ, the man has charisma. Yeah. Oh, I I don't doubt it. Um, uh, it's amazing listening to him like on podcasts and stuff like because he he has so much trouble speaking, mm-hmm. but he's still compelling. Yeah. Um. Like even it's almost like that helps him mm-hmm. in somewhat weird way. Like I don't know. Yeah. It gets better the longer he talks. It seems. Yeah, well, the more you hear it, because well, like, maybe it was, that's it. I think that's what it is. I just assumed that like something was getting loosened up in there or something. I don't as know. he got going, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Either I, way, it it works. <sighs> yeah, um, he was he was interesting, uh, but it was a very safe speech for libertarians. He yeah, he didn't really he didn't really. 
push anything or I don't know. It was definitely tailored for us and to be very easy to swallow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Trump didn't do that. That's for sure. No. <laughs> so yeah, yeah but you got to respect him for that. He's, he's going to get up there and toot his own horn. Like it, it's, that's who he is. Yeah. Like. <laughs> Oh so, man, he's something that. It, so there were points where, like, the jeers I understood, yeah. like when he was claiming credit for something that he's got no business claiming credit for, yeah. um, or like when he's talking about how um, under him was the best economy, <laughs> and then Biden got in there and ruined everything, and we got this inflation after Biden. Like, no, you're the cause of this, or at least started it. I mean, right? Yeah, it didn't end with you printing money. I mean, Biden printed a bunch of money too, but yeah. it's not like you didn't have anything to do with this. All right. Well, my biggest thing listening to him was. And what if he had been smart, he just wouldn't have done because he has to attack Biden constantly. Yeah. But every time he would attack Biden, it would just like in my mind ring that, oh, yeah, you're no better than him. Yeah. Well, a lot of people were saying actually screaming that yeah. that, that was yeah. some of the heckling. Yeah. Well, it, it, it was warranted. Like I say, yeah. um, if he would just kind of stay off some of that, it might have been more of a compelling speech for me, at least. Well, I, I mean, we recognize, though, that for the libertarian... Trump has a, is much more likely to get libertarian votes than Biden is. Yeah, yeah. Um, Biden has been one of the most anti-liberty presidents maybe ever. Yeah. And Trump made his mistakes. Trump allowed lockdowns. Trump allowed mandates. Trump pushed the vaccine. Trump was unable or unwilling, no. but at least unable to actually end wars while he was in office. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, Trump ended the JCPOA. He yeah. pulled out of the nuclear treaties. Like Trump made some huge mistakes for libertarians. Yeah. But he did roll back some regulation. Oh, he's got the protectionism thing. Libertarians aren't oh, yeah. generally on board with that. Can't have that yeah. um, we believe in a free market, but he, did roll back some regulation. He did reduce taxes. He, I mean, there are things that, that libertarians like. There are like things that, he can tout. Yeah. But, and Biden doesn't have any of that. No, none at all. So, you know, you think that Trump got a bad reception at the Libertarian Party. Oh, man. Biden was smart not to show up because his would have been worse. Oh, it would have wholeheartedly been worse. Trump's may would have been better if Biden had been there. Yeah, it's funny because Biden was saying, look how unpopular Trump is. It's like, yeah, well, we know why you didn't show up. Yeah, man. no joke. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we should wrap up because we're really running long and we've only yeah. talked about one thing. Yeah. And But we needed, we needed the boots on the ground from the convention. You yep. were there. I was there. So, like I say, it's, uh, it's good to kind of get that. I'm, I'm sure our listeners appreciate it. There's plenty of libertarians that listen. About halfway through the afternoon of every business meeting in the convention, I got a drink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you Man. needed it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. That'll drive you to drink. Yep. Uh, is, mm. yeah. More than a little tedious sometimes, but it was it was a good weekend. And I like the people there. Yeah. And it... I, I am disappointed in how it's been presented, um, our reaction. We do seem kind of foolish in a lot of ways. And here's the other thing. People were kind of, in fact, Elijah on our delegation. Yeah. I love Elijah. Elijah's a good guy. Oh, yeah. Um, Elijah was saying, you know, people came down to the hotel to party with us after the Trump speech. Yeah, because they, you know, saw a bunch of libertarians up there yelling "f Trump," et cetera, and they wanted to come down and party with us. Like yeah. we're rocks. This is DC, of course, right? So a yeah. bunch of left wingers, but um, you know, they wanted to come party with us, and like we're rock stars all of a sudden. And I'm like, yeah, that's not why I want to be a rock star. Yeah, I don't want to be a rock star because I appeal to the crazy left wing that right. thinks that somehow Trump is the worst thing that's ever existed. That he's the antichrist or a yeah. reincarnation of Hitler or whatever it is that they think. And so <laughs> yeah. we cursed him. And so that makes, no, that's not why I want them to come down to party with us. Yeah. I want them coming down to party with us because we have the right answers that we're offering them freedom, that we're offering them 
uh, real liberty and economic liberty and political liberty and social liberty, that we're giving them, offering them an alternative to the system or at least the establishment that has not worked. That's yeah. why I want people partying with us and coming down to hang out with us. I want them to learn about what we have to say, not just that we hate Trump. Exactly. Because hate yeah. Trump is not something that's going to keep people around. No. Well, it's not productive. Yeah. It's just not. So anyway, I, I think it's unfortunate how how it played out. And I wish that people had just been respectful. And if you didn't want to hear what he had to say, then just don't go. Yeah, exactly. Very simple. Yeah. Oh, well, um, at, at least I hope that we've expressed some of our feelings about what he had to say. So, yeah, from real libertarians, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the believe in free speech. Absolutely. <laughs> no, that sounded terrible. Now I feel like I'm attacking all the other people. I am kind of, <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, sorry for the week off. I was in DC. Yeah. reporting on this particular event, <laughs> exactly. um, gathering information as it were. Yep. And, uh, but we will be back next week. Um, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or Podbean and, or Podbean, um, like, and share comment, subscribe, uh, leave criticisms or reviews. You can always email me at Michael at the Liberty And, uh, We'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.